Chapter 9 Self-Created Suffering and Change What type of future will come about to a large extent lies within your own hands in the present. It will be determined by the kind of initiatives that we take now. We have discussed the importance of accepting suffering as a natural fact of human existence and facing our problems directly and authentically. While some kinds of suffering are inevitable, others are self-created. With growing technology, the general level of physical comfort has improved for many in Western society. This has caused a critical shift in perception. As suffering becomes less visible, it is no longer seen as part of the fundamental nature of human beings, but rather as an anomaly, a sign that something has gone terribly wrong, a sign of the failure of some system, an infringement on our guaranteed right to happiness. This kind of thinking poses hidden dangers. If we think of suffering as something unnatural, something that we shouldn't be experiencing, then it's not much of a leap to begin to look for someone to blame for our suffering. If I'm unhappy, then I must be the victim of someone or something, an idea that is all too common in the West. The victimizer may be the government, the educational system, abusive partners, a dysfunctional family, the other gender, or our uncaring mate. Or we may turn blame inward. There's something wrong with me. I'm the victim of disease, of defective genes perhaps. By continuing to focus on assigning blame and maintaining a victim stance, we perpetuate our suffering and our related feelings of anger, frustration, and resentment. This is one way that we can create our own suffering, but we add to our own suffering in other ways also. All too often, for example, we perpetuate pain, keep it alive, by replaying our hurts over and over in our minds, elaborating and magnifying our injustices in the process. We can see that there are many ways in which we actively contribute to our own experiences of mental unrest and suffering. Although in general, mental and emotional afflictions themselves can come naturally, often it is our own reinforcement of those negative emotions that make them so much worse. For instance, when we have anger or hatred towards a person and we keep on thinking about it over and over, then it feeds the hatred. It makes it very powerful and intense. We also often add to our pain and suffering by being very overly sensitive, overreacting to minor things, and sometimes taking things too personally. So I think that to a large extent, whether or not you suffer depends on how you respond to a given situation. For example, let's say that you find out that someone is speaking badly of you behind your back. If you react to this knowledge that someone is speaking badly of you, this negativity, with a feeling of hurt or anger, then you yourself destroy your own peace of mind. Your pain is your own personal creation. On the other hand, if you can refrain from reacting in a negative way, let the slander pass by you as if it were silent wind passing behind your ears, you would protect yourself from that feeling of hurt, and feeling of agony. So, although you may not always be able to avoid difficult situations, you can modify the extent to which you suffer by how you choose to respond to the situation. Therapists sometimes call the process described by the Dalai Lama personalizing our pain, the tendency to narrow our psychological field of vision by interpreting or misinterpreting everything that occurs in terms of its impact on us. When this kind of thinking becomes a pervasive pattern and extends to include every comment made by our family or friends, or even events in society at large, it can become a significant source of our misery. As Jacques Lusteron, a survivor of the Buchenwald concentration camp, wrote in later recounting his experiences in the camps, Unhappiness, I saw then, comes to each of us because we think ourselves at the center of the universe, because we have the miserable conviction that we alone suffer to the point of unbearable intensity. As we've discussed, problems invariably arise in our daily life, but problems do not automatically cause suffering. If we directly address a problem and focus our energies on finding a solution, for instance, 
the problem can be transformed into a challenge. If we throw into the mix, however, a feeling that our problem is unfair, we add an additional ingredient that can become a powerful fuel in creating mental and emotional suffering. The Dalai Lama spoke about how to deal with the problem of unfairness. There may be a variety of ways that one might deal with the feeling that one's suffering is unfair. We've already spoken of the importance of accepting suffering as a natural fact of existence. Tibetans, or those of a Buddhist background, may be able to better accept the reality of difficult situations by attributing it to karma, to negative actions committed in either this or a previous life. For those in the West who believe in the idea of a creator, of God, they may accept difficult situations easier by viewing them as part of God's creation or plan. They may be helped by the faith that even though the situation appears very negative, God is all-powerful and very merciful, and there may be some meaning behind the situation that they may be unaware of. For those with no religious beliefs, perhaps a practical scientific approach could help, a kind of examination of the situation without much emotional involvement. A rational objective analysis of difficult or problematic situations can be quite important, because with this approach you'll often discover that behind the scenes there may be other factors at play. For instance, if you feel that you're being treated unfairly by your boss at work, perhaps he may be annoyed by something else, an argument with his wife that morning or something, and his behavior may have nothing to do with you personally, may not be specifically directed at you. Of course, one must still face whatever the situation may be, but at least with this approach, one may not have the additional anxiety that would come along with it. Often, our normal tendency is to try to blame our problems on others, on external factors. Furthermore, we tend to look for one single cause and then try to exonerate ourselves from the responsibility. It seems that whenever there are intense emotions involved, there tends to be a disparity between how things appear and how they really are. This practice involves looking at things in a holistic way. Realizing that there are many events contributing to a situation. So, for instance, in general, if we carefully examine any situation in a very unbiased and honest way, we may realize that to a large extent we are also responsible for the unfolding of events. Through practices such as these, such as objectively analyzing our own contribution to problems, which we initially blame completely on others, one can begin to reduce the feeling of unfairness that is one of the most common sources of self-created suffering. In investigating the ways in which we contribute to our own experience of suffering, we conclude with one of the primary causes, resistance to change. In discussing this important topic, the Dalai Lama described the ever-changing nature of life. It's extremely important to investigate the causes or origins of suffering, how it arises. One must begin that process by appreciating the impermanent, transient nature of our existence. All things, events, and phenomena are dynamic, changing every moment. Nothing remains static. Meditation on one's blood circulation could serve to reinforce this idea. The blood is constantly flowing, moving. It never stands still. This momentarily changing nature phenomena is like a built-in mechanism. And since it is the nature of all phenomena to change every moment, this indicates to us that all things lack the ability to endure lack the ability to remain the same. And since all things are subject to change, nothing exists in a permanent condition, nothing is able to remain the same under its own independent power. 
Thus, all things are under the power or influence of other factors. So, at any given moment, no matter how pleasant or pleasurable your experience may be, it will not last. This becomes the basis of a category of suffering known in Buddhism as the suffering of change. The concept of impermanence plays a central role in Buddhist thought. As the Dalai Lama has noted, it serves to remind us that life is tenuous and our time must be used to one's best advantage. On a deeper level, the contemplation of the more subtle aspects of impermanence, the impermanent nature of all phenomena, begins the Buddhist practitioner's quest to understand the true nature of reality and through this understanding dispel the ignorance that is the ultimate source of our suffering. But whether one looks at life from a Buddhist perspective or a Western perspective, the fact remains that life is change. And to the degree that we refuse to accept this fact and resist the natural changes of life, trying desperately to hold on to the past, for example, we will continue to perpetuate our own suffering. Chapter 10 Shifting Perspective The ability to look at events from different perspectives can be very helpful. Then practicing this, one can use certain experiences, certain tragedies, to develop a calmness of mind. The ability to shift perspective can be one of the most powerful and effective tools we have to help us cope with life's daily problems, both large and small. One must realize that every phenomena, every event, has different aspects. Everything is of a relative nature. For example, in my own case, I lost my country. It is very tragic, and there are even worse things. There's a lot of destruction happening in our country. That's a very negative thing. But if I look at the same event from another angle, I realize that as a refugee, I have another perspective. As a refugee, there is no need for formalities, ceremony, protocol. If everything were status quo, if things were okay, then on a lot of occasions, you merely go through the motions, you pretend, but when you are passing through desperate situations, there's no time to pretend. So from that angle, this tragic experience has been very useful to me. Also, being a refugee creates a lot of new opportunities for meeting with many people. People from different religious traditions, from different walks of life, those who I may not have met had I remained in my country. So, in that sense, it's been very, very useful. It seems that often when problems arise, our outlook becomes narrow. All of our attention may be focused on worrying about the problems, and we may have a sense that we are the only one that is going through such difficulties. This can lead to a kind of self-absorption that can make the problem seem very intense. When this happens... I think that seeing this from a wider perspective can definitely help realizing, for instance, that there are many other people who have gone through similar experiences and even worse experiences. This practice of shifting perspective can even be helpful in certain illnesses or pain. If you only look at that one event, then it appears bigger and bigger. If you focus too closely, too intensely on a problem when it occurs, it appears uncontrollable. But if you compare that event with some other greater event, look at the same problem from a distance, then it appears smaller and less overwhelming. The ability to shift perspective, the capacity to view one's problems from different angles, is nurtured by a certain supple quality of mind. The ultimate benefit of a supple and flexible mind is that it allows us to embrace all of life, to be fully alive and human. Following a long day of public talks in Tucson one afternoon, the Dalai Lama slowly walked back to his hotel suite. As he walked, a bank of magenta rain clouds spanned the sky, absorbing the late afternoon light and sending the Catalina Mountains into deep relief. The entire landscape, a vast palette of purple hues, 
the effect was spectacular. The warm air was laden with the fragrance of desert plants, of sage, a moist, restless breeze holding the promise of an unbridled storm. The Dalai Lama stopped. For several moments, he quietly surveyed the horizon, taking in the entire panorama, finally commenting on the beauty of the setting. He walked on, but after a few steps, he paused again, bending down to examine a tiny lavender bud on a small plant. He touched it gently, noting its delicate form, and wondered aloud about the name of the plant. I was struck by the facility of his mind. His awareness seemed to move so easily from taking in the complete landscape to focusing on a single bud, a simultaneous appreciation of the totality of the environment as well as the smallest detail, a capacity to encompass all facets and the full spectrum of life. Every one of us can develop this same suppleness of mind. It comes about, at least in part, directly through our efforts to stretch our perspective and deliberately try on new viewpoints. This can result in a simultaneous awareness of the big picture as well as our individual circumstances, putting our experiences in proper proportion. This dual outlook, a concurrent view of the big world and our own little world, can act as an internal navigational system, guiding us towards ultimate fulfillment of both our own goals and larger societal goals. When you speak of adopting a wider perspective, this includes working cooperatively with other people. When you have crises, which are global by nature, for instance, such as the environment or problems of modern economic structure, this calls for a coordinated and concerted effort among many people with a sense of responsibility and commitment. This is more encompassing than an individual or personal issue. Of course, change must come from within the individual. But when you are seeking to find solutions to global problems, this requires the ability to address problems from various levels, the individual level, the community level, and the global level. Now, for instance, minimizing hatred is like internal disarmament. But internal disarmament must go with external disarmament. The whole world should be demilitarized. That is our ultimate goal. Of course, we cannot achieve this overnight. I think the realistic way is step by step. So on one level, we should be working towards developing inner peace. But at the same time, it's very important to work towards external disarmament and peace as well making a small contribution in whatever way we can. That's our responsibility. We've seen how there is a reciprocal relationship between a supple mind and the ability to shift perspective. A supple, flexible mind helps us address our problems from a variety of perspectives, and conversely, deliberately trying to objectively examine our problems from a variety of perspectives can be seen as a kind of flexibility training for the mind. In today's world, the attempt to develop a flexible mode of thinking isn't simply a self-indulgent exercise for idle intellectuals. It can be a matter of survival. Even on an evolutionary scale, the species that were most adaptable were the ones that survived and thrived. Life today is characterized by sudden, unexpected, and sometimes violent change. A supple mind can help us reconcile the external changes going on all around us. It can also help us integrate all of our internal conflicts, inconsistencies, and ambivalence. Without a pliant mind, our outlook becomes brittle and our relationship to the world is characterized by fear. But by adopting a flexible approach to life, we can maintain our composure even under the most restless and turbulent conditions and nurture the resiliency of the human spirit. Chapter 11 Finding Meaning in Pain and Suffering By realizing the nature of suffering, you will develop a greater resolve to put an end to the causes of suffering. If shifting perspective is one way to make life's trials and problems more bearable, another is to be able to find meaning in pain and suffering. As Viktor Frankl, a Jewish psychiatrist imprisoned by the Nazis in World War II, once said, Man is ready and willing to shoulder any suffering, 
as soon and as long as he can see meaning in it. In discussing how personal suffering can take on meaning, the Dalai Lama illustrates how suffering can be put to practical use within the context of the Buddhist tradition. In Buddhist practice, one can use one's personal suffering in a formal way to enhance compassion by using it as an opportunity for the practice of Tonglin, or giving and receiving, a Mahayana visualization practice in which one mentally visualizes taking on another's pain and suffering and in turn giving them all of your resources, good health, fortune, and so on. So, in doing this practice, when you undergo illness, pain, or suffering, you can use that as an opportunity by thinking, may my suffering be a substitute for all the suffering of other sentient beings. By experiencing this, may I be able to save all other sentient beings who may have to undergo similar suffering. In describing this practice, if, for instance, you become ill and practice this technique, thinking, may my illness act as a substitute for others who are suffering from similar illness, and you visualize taking on their suffering and giving them your good health, I am not suggesting that you ignore your own health. However, once you do become ill, practices such as Tongling can make a significant difference in how you respond to the situation. Practicing Tongling meditation may not necessarily succeed in alleviating the real physical pain or lead to a cure in physical terms, but it can definitely protect you from unnecessary additional psychological pain, suffering, and anguish. One can think, May I, by experiencing this pain and suffering, be able to help other people and save others who may have to go through the same experience? Then your suffering takes on a new meaning, as it is used as the basis for a religious or spiritual practice. And on top of that, in the cases of some individuals practicing this technique, that instead of being sorry and saddened by the experience, the person can see it as a kind of privilege. The person can perceive it as a kind of opportunity and, in fact, be joyful because this particular experience made him or her richer. Paradoxically, the ability to embrace and understand suffering, to find meaning in it or some practical value in it, becomes part of our pursuit of happiness. The Dalai Lama explains how from a Buddhist perspective, for instance, our suffering acts as a kind of catalyst. Within the framework of the Buddhist path, reflecting on suffering has tremendous importance. Because by realizing the nature of suffering, you will develop greater resolve to put an end to the causes of suffering and the unwholesome deeds which lead to suffering. And it will increase your enthusiasm for engaging in the wholesome actions and deeds which lead to happiness and joy. By reflecting on suffering during the quieter moments in our lives, when things are relatively stable and going well, we may discover a deeper value, meaning, or purpose in our suffering. Sometimes, however, we may be confronted with kinds of suffering that seem to have no purpose, with no redeeming qualities whatsoever. Physical pain and suffering often seems to belong to that category. But upon closer examination, Even physical pain clearly has a purpose. In his book, Pain, the Gift Nobody Wants, Dr. Paul Brand, a world-renowned hand surgeon and leprosy specialist, explored the purpose and value of physical pain. Leprosy is a disease that causes loss of pain sensation in the limbs, and without the protection of pain, the leprosy patients lack the system to warn them of tissue damage. It is this that causes the horrible disfigurements. After describing his lifelong work with patients who suffer from lack of pain sensation and seeing the devastating effects, Dr. Brand gradually came to view pain not as the universal enemy, but as a remarkable, elegant, and sophisticated biological system that warns us of damage to our body and thus protects us. He feels that we may not be grateful for the experience of pain, but we can be grateful for the system of pain perception. And beyond that, He feels that not only can our attitude about pain change by understanding its meaning and purpose, 
but that change in attitude can actually lessen the degree to which we suffer when we are physically injured. Like many other researchers, he sees the difference between physical pain, which is a physiological process, and suffering, which is our mental and emotional response to the pain. We convert pain into suffering in the mind. To lessen the suffering of pain, we need to make a crucial distinction between the pain of the pain and the pain we create by our thoughts about the pain. It is well recognized that fear, anger, guilt, loneliness, and helplessness are all mental and emotional responses that can intensify pain. So, in dealing with pain, we can, of course, work at the lower levels of pain perception using the tools of modern medicine, such as medication, but we can also work at the higher levels by modifying our outlook and attitude. In seeking to discover an underlying purpose to our physical pain, Dr. Paul Brand makes one additional fascinating and critical observation. He describes many reports of leprosy patients claiming, Now, of course, I can see my hands and my feet, but somehow they don't feel like part of me. It feels as if they were just tools. Thus, pain not only warns us and protects us, it unifies us. Without pain sensation in our hands and feet, those parts no longer seem to belong to our body and that is associated with a kind of indifference to injury to them. In the same way that physical pain unifies our sense of having a body, the Dalai Lama reminds us that the general experience of suffering acts as a unifying force that connects us with others. Perhaps that is the ultimate meaning behind our suffering. It is the most basic element we share with others, the factor that unifies us with all living creatures. Third Meditation The Practice of Tong Len At the end of one of his sessions in Arizona, the Dalai Lama instructed the audience in the visualization practice of Tong Len. As we have heard, it is both an exercise for strengthening compassion and a powerful tool for helping transmute one's personal suffering. This afternoon, let us meditate on the practice of Tong Len, giving and receiving. This practice is meant to help train the mind to strengthen the force of compassion. This is achieved because Tonglin meditation helps to counteract our selfishness. It increases the power and strength of our mind by enhancing our courage to open ourselves to others' suffering. To begin this exercise, first visualize on one side of you a group of people who are in desperate need of help, those who are in an unfortunate state of suffering, those living under conditions of poverty, hardship, and pain. Visualize this group of people on one side of you clearly in your mind. Then on the other side, visualize yourself as the embodiment of a self-centered person with a customary selfish attitude, indifferent to the well-being and needs of others. And then in between this suffering group of people and this selfish representation of you, see yourself in the middle as a neutral observer. Next, notice which side you are naturally inclined toward. See whether your natural feeling of empathy reaches out to the group of weaker people who are in need, or if it is inclined more towards that single individual, the embodiment of selfishness on the other side. If you look objectively, you can see that the well-being of a group or a large number of individuals is more important than that of one single individual. After that, focus your attention on the needy and desperate people. Direct all of your positive energy toward them. Mentally, give them your successes, your resources, your collection of virtues, and take upon yourself their suffering, their problems, and all their negativities. For example, you can visualize an innocent starving child from Somalia and feel how you would respond naturally towards that sight. In this instance, when you experience a deep feeling of empathy towards the suffering of that individual, it isn't based on considerations like he's my relative 
or she's my friend. You don't even know that person. But the fact that the other person is a human being, and you, yourself, are a human being, allows your natural capacity for empathy to emerge, enabling you to reach out. So you can visualize something like that and think, this child has no capacity of his or her own to be able to relieve himself or herself from his or her present state of difficulty or hardship. Then mentally take upon yourself all the suffering of poverty, starvation, and the feeling of deprivation, and mentally give your facilities, wealth, and success to this child. So, through practicing this kind of giving and receiving visualization, you can train your mind. When engaging in this practice, it is sometimes helpful to begin by first imagining your own future suffering and with an attitude of compassion. Take your own future suffering upon yourself right now with the wish of freeing yourself from all future suffering. After you gain some practice, you can then expand the process to include taking on the suffering of others. When you do the visualization of taking upon yourself, it is useful to visualize these sufferings, problems, and difficulties in the form of poisonous substances, dangerous weapons, or terrifying animals, things that, normally, the very sight of which makes you shudder. So visualize the suffering in these forms, and then absorb them directly into your heart. The purpose of visualizing these negative and frightening forms being dissolved into our hearts is to destroy our habitual selfish attitudes that reside there. However, for those individuals who may have problems with self-image, self-hatred, or low self-esteem, then it is important to judge for themselves whether this particular practice is appropriate or not. This Tonglin practice can become quite powerful if you combine the giving and receiving with the breath. That is, imagine receiving when inhaling and giving when exhaling. When you do this visualization effectively, it will make you feel some slight discomfort. That is an indication that it is hitting its target the self-centered, egocentric attitude that we normally have. Part 4. Overcoming Obstacles Chapter 12. Bringing About Change Our positive states of mind can act as antidotes to our negative tendencies and illusory states of mind. It is important to remember that the Dalai Lama's emphasis on recognizing the inevitability of suffering and the uses of suffering emerge from a fundamentally optimistic context, the Buddhist belief in the possibility of genuine transformation and change. Earlier, we mentioned that in seeking happiness, we begin by learning about how negative emotions and behaviors are harmful to us and how positive states of mind are helpful. But in discussing an approach to bringing about positive changes within oneself, learning is only the first step. There are other factors as well. Conviction, determination, action, and effort. Next, one transforms determination into action. The strong determination to change enables us to make a sustained effort to implement the actual changes. The final factor of effort is critical. Now, no matter what behavior you are seeking to change, no matter what particular goal or action you are directing your efforts towards, you need to start by developing a strong willingness or wish to do it. You need to generate great enthusiasm. And here, a sense of urgency is a key factor. For example, knowledge about the serious effects of AIDS 
has definitely created a sense of urgency that has put a check on a lot of people's sexual behavior. I think that often, once we obtain the proper information, that sense of seriousness and commitment will come. So, this sense of urgency can be a vital factor in affecting change, it can give us tremendous energy. For instance, in a political movement, if there is a sense of desperation, there can be a tremendous sense of urgency. So much so that people may even forget they are hungry, and there is no feeling of tiredness or exhaustion in pursuit of their objectives. I asked the Dalai Lama if there was a particular Buddhist approach to help develop that sense of urgency. For a Buddhist practitioner to generate a sense of confidence and enthusiasm, we find in the Buddhist texts a discussion of the preciousness of human existence. We talk about how much potential lies within our body, how meaningful it can be, the good purposes it can be used for, the benefits and advantages of having a human form. Then, in order to generate a sense of urgency, to engage in spiritual practices, the practitioner is reminded of one's impermanence, of death. The awareness of impermanence is encouraged so that when it is coupled with your appreciation of the enormous potential of your human existence, it will give you a sense of urgency that I must use every precious moment. Given the Dalai Lama's view that one must generate a high degree of enthusiasm to affect positive changes in one's life, I asked him about his approach to overcoming apathy. He suggested first ruling out a physical or biological cause that may contribute to a feeling of low energy or laziness. Then he continued. To overcome apathy and generate enthusiasm, to overcome one's negative behaviors and states of mind. Once again, I think the most effective method, and perhaps the only solution, is to be constantly aware of the destructive effects of the negative behavior. One may need to repeatedly remind oneself of those destructive effects. Now, most people want to make positive changes in their lives but sometimes we simply become habituated or accustomed to doing things in certain ways. And then we become sort of spoiled, doing only the things that we like to do, that we are used to doing. But we can also use habituation to our advantage. Through constant familiarity, we can definitely establish new behavior patterns. So by making a steady effort, I think we can overcome any form of negative conditioning and make positive changes in our lives. But you still need to realize that genuine change doesn't happen overnight. Deep down, mental development takes time and a consistent effort. Because of the slow and gradual nature of change and transformation, I wondered what prevented the Dalai Lama from becoming discouraged or losing hope. As far as my own spiritual practice goes, if I encounter some obstacles or problems, I find it helpful to stand back and take the long-term view rather than the short-term view. In this regard, I find that thinking about one particular verse gives me courage and helps me sustain my determination. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, may I too live to dispel the miseries of the world. However, as far as the struggle for the freedom of Tibet is concerned, if I utilize that kind of belief, being prepared to wait as long as space endures for eons and eons and so on, I think that would be foolish. Here, one needs to take more immediate or active involvement. But even in the situation in Tibet, I think that viewing the situation from a wider perspective can definitely help. For instance, if I look at the situation inside Tibet from a narrow perspective, focusing only on that, then the situation appears almost hopeless. However, 
if I look from a wider perspective, a world perspective, then I see the international situation in which whole communist and totalitarian systems are collapsing, where even in China there's a democracy movement and the spirit of Tibetans remains high. So I don't give up. There's no doubt that in order to accomplish important goals, we need a strong driving mechanism to sustain us. Looking at the factors that motivate us to action, psychologists have identified three principal types of human motives. Primary motives are drives based on biological needs that must be met for survival, such as food, water, and air. Another category of motives involves our innate need for stimulation and information. The final category, called secondary motives, are those based on learned needs, such as the need for success, status, power, or achievement. These are acquired drives that can be influenced by social forces and shaped by learning. And it is at this level that modern psychological theories meet the Buddhist concept of developing determination and enthusiasm. In Buddhism, however, these acquired drives are not used only in the pursuit of worldly success, but in pursuit of higher goals, kindness, compassion, and spirituality and develop as one gains a clearer understanding of the factors that lead to true happiness. Once we have built up a certain degree of drive and determination to make the changes necessary to live a happier life, we must then set about implementing these changes in our customary ways of thinking and acting. While science has recently revealed that one's genetic predisposition plays some role in an individual's characteristic way of responding to the world, most social scientists and psychologists feel that a large measure of the way we behave, think, and feel is determined by learning and conditioning, which comes about as a result of our upbringing and the various social and cultural forces around us. And since it is believed that behaviors are largely established by conditioning and reinforced and amplified by habituation, this opens up the possibility, as the Dalai Lama contends, of extinguishing harmful or negative conditioning and replacing it with helpful, life-enhancing conditioning. In eliminating one's negative emotions and states of mind, however, one question arises. Since these negative emotions seem to be a natural or integral part of our psychological makeup, is it really reasonable or practical to try to eradicate them? Yes. Some people suggest that anger, hatred, and other negative emotions are a natural part of our mind and there is no way to really change these mental states. But that is wrong. Now, for example, all of us are born in an ignorant state. In this sense, ignorance is also quite natural. But as we grow through education and learning, we can acquire knowledge and dispel ignorance. And in that same way, through proper training, we can gradually reduce our negative emotions and increase positive states of mind, such as love, compassion, and forgiveness. When speaking of these negative states of mind, I am referring to what are called Yang Meng in Tibetan, or Klesha in Sanskrit. This term literally means that which afflicts from within. It is often translated as delusions. It's easy to recognize the afflictive nature of these delusions simply because they have this tendency to destroy our calmness and presence of mind. But it's much more difficult to find out whether or not we can overcome them. That is a question that directly relates to the whole idea of whether or not it is possible to attain the full realization of our spiritual potential. That is a very serious and difficult situation. Now, in Buddhist thought, we have three principal premises on which we believe that can happen. The first premise is that all deluded states of mind, all afflictive emotions and thoughts, are essentially distorted in that they are rooted in misperceiving the actual reality of the situation. No matter how powerful, deep down these negative emotions have no valid foundation. They are based on ignorance. On the other hand, Positive emotions or states of mind, such as love, compassion, insight, have a solid basis. 
When the mind is experiencing these positive states, there is no distortion. In addition, these positive factors are grounded in reality. They can be verified by our own experience. There is a kind of grounding and rootedness in reason and understanding, and this is not the case with afflictive emotions like anger and hatred. On top of that, all these positive states of mind have the quality that you can enhance them and increase them to a limitless degree if you regularly practice them through training and constant familiarity. The second premise on which we base the claim that our negative emotions can be rooted out and eliminated is based on the fact that our positive states of mind can act as antidotes to our negative tendencies and illusory states of mind. And as you enhance the capacity of these antidotal factors, the greater their force the more you will be able to reduce the force of the mental and emotional afflictions. Within Buddhist practice, the cultivation of certain specific positive mental qualities such as patience, tolerance, kindness, and so on can act as specific antidotes to negative states of mind such as anger, hatred, and attachment. But since these positive antidotes seek to eliminate only certain specific emotions, in some sense they can be seen as only partial measures. These afflictive emotions, such as attachment and hatred, are ultimately rooted in ignorance, misconception of the true nature of reality. Therefore, in order to fully overcome all of these negative tendencies, one must apply the antidote to ignorance, the wisdom factor. The wisdom factor involves generating insight into the true nature of reality. So we not only have specific antidotes for specific negative emotions, for example, patience and tolerance act as specific antidotes to anger and hatred, but we also have a general antidote insight into the true nature of reality that acts as an antidote to all negative states of mind. It is similar to getting rid of a poisonous plant. You can eliminate the harmful effects by cutting off the specific branches or leaves, or you can eliminate the entire plant by uprooting it. The third premise is that the essential nature of mind is pure. It is based on the belief that the underlying basic subtle consciousness is untainted by negative emotions. Its nature is pure, a state which is referred to as the mind of clear light. That basic nature of the mind is also called Buddha nature. So since negative emotions are not an intrinsic part of this Buddha nature, there is a possibility to eliminate them and purify the mind. The Dalai Lama's method of achieving full potential and becoming happy is radically different from most Western approaches. While we're used to the idea, for example, of using psychotherapeutic techniques such as behavior therapy to attack specific bad habits, such as smoking, drinking, or temper flares, we are not accustomed to systematically cultivating positive attributes, love, compassion, generosity, as weapons against all negative states. The Dalai Lama's method for achieving happiness is based on the revolutionary idea that negative mental states are not an intrinsic part of our minds. They are transient obstacles that obstruct the expression of our underlying natural state of joy and happiness. And these obstacles can be neutralized through the antidotes, or the corresponding positive mental states. And when this discipline, derived from Buddhist thought, is viewed in the light of scientific evidence showing that we can change the very structure and function of the brain by establishing new conditioning that comes about by deliberately cultivating new ways of thinking, then the idea that we can achieve happiness through training of the mind 
seems a very real possibility. Chapter 13. Dealing with Anger and Hatred If one comes across a person who has been shot by an arrow, one does not spend time wondering about where the arrow came from, or the cast of the individual who shot it, or analyzing the type of wood the shaft is made of, or the manner in which the arrowhead was fashioned. Rather, one should focus on immediately pulling out the arrow. This observation of the Buddhas leads us to the next step in the Dalai Lama's approach to reshaping our minds and hearts. The Dalai Lama now turns to some of the arrows, the negative states of mind that destroy our happiness, beginning with the discussion of anger and hatred. Generally speaking, there are many different kinds of afflictive or negative emotions, such as conceit, arrogance, jealousy, desire, lust, closed-mindedness, and so on. But out of all these, hatred and anger are considered to be the greatest evil because they are the greatest obstacle to developing compassion and altruism, and they destroy one's virtue and calmness of mind. Now, under rare circumstances, some kinds of anger can be positive. When motivated by compassion, it can act as a powerful force to bring about swift and decisive action. But generally speaking, anger leads to ill-feeling and hatred, and hatred is never positive. It has no benefit at all. It is always totally negative. The destructive effects of hatred are very visible, very obvious and immediate. For example, when a very strong or forceful thought of hatred arises within you, at that very instant, it totally overwhelms you and destroys your peace of mind. Your presence of mind disappears completely. When such intense anger and hatred arises, it obliterates the best part of your brain, which is the ability to judge between right and wrong, and the long-term and short-term consequences of your actions. Your power of judgment becomes totally inoperable. It can no longer function. It is almost like you have become insane. Even at the physical level, hatred brings about a very ugly, unpleasant physical transformation of the individual. For reasons such as these, hatred is compared to an enemy. This inner enemy has no other function than causing you harm, destroying us, both in the immediate term and the long term. It is your true enemy, your ultimate enemy. This is very different from an ordinary enemy. Although an ordinary enemy may engage in activities that are harmful to us, at least he or she has many other functions. That person has got to eat and sleep. He or she cannot devote 24 hours a day of his or her existence to this project of destroying us. On the other hand, Hatred has no other function, no other purpose than destroying us. So realizing this fact, you should resolve that you will never give an opportunity for this enemy, hatred, to arise within you. We cannot overcome anger and hatred simply by suppressing them. We need to actively cultivate the antidotes to hatred, patience and tolerance. When you are engaged in the practice of patience and tolerance, in reality, what is happening is you are engaged in a combat with hatred and anger. Since it is a situation of combat, you seek victory. But you also have to be prepared for the possibility of losing that battle. So while you are engaged in combat, you should not lose sight of the fact that in the process, you will confront many problems. You should have the ability to withstand these hardships. Someone who gains victory through such an arduous process is a true hero. In some cases, people harbor strong feelings of anger and hurt based on something done to them in the past. And that feeling is kept bottled up. Under such circumstances, there is a Tibetan expression which says, that if there is any sickness in the conch shell, if anything is blocking the shell, you can clear it out by blowing it out. Similarly, it is possible to imagine a situation in which due to the bottling up of certain emotions, it may be better 
to just let it out and express it. However, I believe that generally speaking, anger and hatred are the type of emotions which, if you leave them unchecked or unattended, they tend to aggravate and keep on increasing. So, if you work toward building inner contentment and cultivating kindness and compassion, this brings about a certain calmness of mind that can help prevent anger from arising in the first place. And then when a situation does arise which makes you angry, you should directly confront your anger and analyze it. Investigate what factors have given rise to that particular instance of anger or hatred. Then analyze further, seeing whether it is an appropriate response and especially whether it is constructive or destructive. And you make an effort to exert a certain inner discipline and restraint, actively combating it by applying the antidotes, counteracting these negative emotions with thoughts of patience and tolerance. It's clear that in seeking to eliminate anger and hatred, the intentional cultivation of patience and tolerance is indispensable. In our everyday life experiences, tolerance and patience have great benefits. For instance, developing them will allow us to be able to sustain and maintain our presence of mind. Although you may have experienced many negative events in the past with the development of patience and tolerance, it is possible to let go of your sense of anger and resentment. If you analyze the situation, you would realize that the past is past, so there is no use continuing to feel anger and hatred which does not change the situation, but just causes a disturbance within your mind and causes you continued unhappiness. Another benefit of responding to difficult situations with patience rather than giving in to anger is that you protect yourself from potential undesirable consequences which might come about if you reacted with anger. Because if you respond to situations with anger and hatred, not only does it not protect you from the injury or harm that has already been done to you, but on top of that, you create an additional cause for your own suffering in the future. Since patience or tolerance comes from an ability to remain firm and steadfast, and not to be overwhelmed by the adverse situations or conditions that one faces, one should not see tolerance or patience as a sign of weakness or giving in, but rather as a sign of strength coming from a deep ability to remain firm. Responding to a trying situation with patience and tolerance rather than reacting with anger and hatred involves active restraint which comes from a strong, self-disciplined mind. I think there is a very close connection between humility and patience. Humility involves having the capacity to take a more confrontational stance, having the capacity to retaliate if you wish, yet deliberately deciding not to do so. That is what I would call genuine humility. Now, when we talk about how one should develop tolerance towards those who harm us, one should not misunderstand this to mean that we should just meekly accept whatever is done against us. Sometimes you might encounter situations that require strong countermeasures. I believe, however, that one can take a strong stand and even take strong countermeasure out of a feeling of compassion or a sense of concern for the other, rather than out of anger. One of the reasons why there is a need to adopt a very strong countermeasure against someone is that if you let the harm or the crime that is being perpetuated against you pass, then there is a danger of that person habituating it in a very negative way, which in reality, 
will cause that individual's own downfall and is very destructive in the long run for the individual himself or herself. So you can take countermeasures out of a feeling of compassion and concern for that individual. In Buddhism, a lot of attention is paid to our attitudes towards our rivals or enemies. This is because hatred can be the greatest stumbling block to the development of compassion and happiness. If you can learn to develop patience and tolerance towards your enemies, then everything else becomes much easier. Your compassion towards all others then begins to flow naturally. An end result of patience and tolerance is forgiveness. Fourth and Fifth Meditations on Anger Begin to work with the Dalai Lama's ideas on using patience and tolerance to neutralize anger and hatred through these two simple yet effective meditations. Fourth Meditation Let us imagine a scenario where someone that you know very well, someone who is close or dear to you, is in a situation where the person loses his or her temper. You can imagine this occurring either in a very acrimonious relationship or in a situation where something personally upsetting is happening. The other person is so angry that he or she has lost all of his or her mental composure, creating very negative vibrations, even going to the extent of beating himself or herself up or breaking things. Then reflect upon the immediate effects of this person's rage. You'll see a physical transformation happening to him or her. This person whom you feel close to, whom you like, the very sight of whom gave you pleasure in the past, now turns into this ugly person, even physically speaking. The reason why I think we should visualize this happening to someone else is because it is easier to see the faults of others than to see one's own faults. So using your imagination, do this meditation and visualization for a few minutes. At the end of that visualization, analyze the situation and relate the circumstance to your own experience. See that you yourself have been in this state many times. Resolve that I shall never let myself fall under the sway of such intense anger and hatred. Because if I do that, I will also be in the same position. I will also suffer all these consequences, lose my peace of mind, lose my composure, assume this ugly physical appearance and so on. So once you make that decision, then for the last few minutes of the meditation, focus your mind on that conclusion without further analysis. Simply let your mind remain on your resolution not to fall under the influence of anger and hatred. Fifth Meditation Begin by visualizing someone whom you dislike, someone who annoys you, causes a lot of problems for you, or gets on your nerves. Then, imagine a scenario where the person irritates you or does something that offends you or annoys you. And in your imagination, when you visualize this, let your natural response follow. Just let it flow naturally. See how you feel. See whether that causes the rate of your heartbeat to go up and so on. Examine whether you are comfortable or uncomfortable. See if you immediately become more peaceful or if you develop an uncomfortable mental feeling. Judge for yourself. Investigate. So, for a few minutes, three or four minutes perhaps, judge and experiment. And then at the end of your investigation, if you discover that, yes, it is of no use to allow that irritation to develop, immediately I lose my peace of mind, then say to yourself, 
In the future, I will never do that. Develop that determination. Finally, for the last few minutes of the exercise, place your mind single-pointedly upon that conclusion or determination. So that's the meditation. Chapter 14 Self-Hatred and Human Potential Of course we love ourselves. How can a person hate himself or herself? Buddhist philosophy has a well-entrenched methodology for dealing with hatred and anger that is directed outward. But the idea of self-hatred, of hatred turned inward, was astonishing to the Dalai Lama when he first heard of it. In fact, he only learned of the existence of self-hatred and its prevalence in Western culture during a conference with a group of Western scientists and psychologists held at his home in Dharamsala in 1991. As he became more familiar with the concept, he began to see ways in which the Buddhist doctrine could help one counteract this punishing impulse. When these people began speaking about self-hatred, at first I wasn't certain if I was understanding the concept correctly. Although I thought that I had some understanding of how the mind works, this idea of hating oneself was completely new to me. The reason why I found it quite so unbelievable is that as practicing Buddhists, we are working very hard in trying to overcome our self-centered attitude, our selfish thoughts and motives. From this viewpoint, I think we love and cherish ourselves too much. So to think of this possibility of someone hating themselves was quite, <laughs> quite unbelievable. From the Buddhist point of view, being in a depressed state in a state of discouragement is seen as a kind of an extreme which can clearly be an obstacle to taking the steps necessary to accomplish one's goals. A state of self-hatred is even far more extreme than simply being discouraged and this can be very, very dangerous. For those engaged in Buddhist practice, the antidote to self-hatred would be to reflect upon the fact that all beings, including oneself, have Buddha nature, the seed or potential for perfection, full enlightenment, no matter how weak or poor or deprived one's present situation may be. So those who suffer from self-hatred or self-loathing should avoid contemplating the suffering nature of existence or the underlying unsatisfactory nature of existence. And instead, they should concentrate more on the positive aspects of their existence, such as appreciating the tremendous potential that lies within oneself as a human being. And by reflecting on these opportunities and potentials, they will be able to increase their sense of worth and confidence in themselves. We are gifted human beings with this wonderful human intelligence. On top of that, all human beings have the capacity to be very determined and to direct that strong sense of determination in whatever direction they would like to use it. There is no doubt of this. So, if one maintains an awareness of these potentials and reminds oneself of them repeatedly until it becomes part of one's customary way of perceiving human beings, including oneself, then this could serve to help reduce feelings of discouragement, helplessness, and self-contempt. I think there might be some sort of parallel to the way we treat physical illness. When doctors treat someone for a specific illness, not only do they give antibiotics for the specific condition, but they also make sure that the person's underlying physical condition is such that he or she can take antibiotics and tolerate it. So, in order to ensure that, the doctors make sure, for instance, that the person is generally well-nourished, and often they may also have to give vitamins or whatever to build the body. So long as the person has that underlying strength in his or her body, then there is the potential or capacity within the body 
to heal itself from the illness through medication. Similarly, so long as we know and maintain an awareness that we have this marvelous gift of human intelligence and a capacity to develop determination and use it in positive ways, in some sense, we have this underlying mental health and underlying strength that comes from realizing we have this great human potential. This realization can act as a sort of built-in mechanism which allows us to deal with any difficulty, no matter what situation we are facing, without losing hope or sinking into self-hatred. There is a popular notion in our culture, shared by many contemporary psychotherapists, that self-hatred is rampant within our society. And since we tend to view the world from the perspective of our own cultures, this has led to the assumption that it is a widespread human problem, possibly even an ingrained feature of the human psyche. But the very fact that the Dalai Lama was completely unaware of the very existence of self-hatred until fairly recently, and that it may be virtually unheard of in entire cultures, strongly reminds us that this troubling mental state, like all of the other negative states we have considered, is not an intrinsic part of the human mind. It is not something we are born with, irrevocably saddled with, nor is it an indelible characteristic of our nature. This realization alone can serve to weaken its power, give us hope, and increase our commitment to eliminate it. When first hearing of the concept of self-hatred, the Dalai Lama's initial reaction was, hate oneself, of course we love ourselves. For those who suffer from low self-esteem or self-hatred, or know someone who does, this response may seem incredibly naive at first glance. But on closer investigation, there may be a penetrating truth in his response. Love is difficult to define, and there may be many different definitions. But one definition of love, and perhaps the most pure and exalted kind of love, is an utter, absolute, and unqualified wish for the happiness of another individual. A heartfelt wish for the other's happiness regardless of whether he does something to injure us or even whether we like him. Now deep in our hearts there's no question that every one of us wants to be happy. So, if our definition of love is based on a genuine wish for someone's happiness, then each of us does in fact love himself or herself. Every one of us sincerely wishes for his or her own happiness. So perhaps the Dalai Lama was not far off the mark in his belief that all of us have this underlying self-love, and this idea suggests a powerful antidote to self-hatred. We can directly counteract thoughts of self-contempt by reminding ourselves that no matter how much we may dislike some of our characteristics, underneath it all, we wish ourselves to be happy. And that is a profound kind of love. Part 5. Closing Reflections Chapter 15. The Spiritual Life and Spiritual Values Religion should be a remedy to help reduce the conflict and suffering in the world, not another source of conflict. The art of happiness has many components. As we've seen, it begins with developing an understanding of the truest sources of happiness, and basing our priorities in life on the cultivation of those sources. It involves an inner discipline, a gradual process of rooting out destructive mental states and replacing them with positive constructive ones, such as kindness, tolerance, and forgiveness. In identifying the factors that lead to a full and satisfying life, we conclude with a discussion of the final component, spirituality. There is a natural tendency to associate spirituality with religion. The Dalai Lama's approach to achieving happiness has been shaped by his years of rigorous training as an ordained Buddhist monk. He's also widely regarded as a preeminent Buddhist scholar. For many, however, it is not his grasp of complex philosophical issues that offers the most appeal, but rather his personal warmth, humor, down-to-earth approach to life, and his ability to relate to people as simply one human being to another. Despite his position as one of the most prominent religious figures in the world, it is clear that he does not regard adherence to any one religion as the only form of spirituality. I believe 
that it is essential to appreciate our potential as human beings and to recognize the importance of inner transformation. This should be achieved through what could be called a process of mental development. Sometimes I call this having a spiritual dimension in one's life. There can be two levels of spirituality. One level of spirituality has to do with one's religious beliefs. In this world, there are so many different people, so many different dispositions. There are five billion human beings, and in a certain way, I think we need five billion different religions. I believe that each individual should embark upon a spiritual path that is best suited to his or her mental disposition, temperament, belief, family, and cultural background. Now, for example, as a Buddhist monk, I find Buddhism to be most suitable. So, for myself, I found that Buddhism is best. But that does not mean Buddhism is best for everyone. The purpose of religion is to benefit people. And I think that if we only had one religion, after a while it would cease to benefit many people. If you had a restaurant, for instance, and it only served one dish day after day for every meal, that restaurant wouldn't have many customers left after a while. People need and appreciate diversity in their food because there are so many different tastes. In the same way, religions are meant to nourish the human spirit, and I think we can learn to celebrate that diversity and develop a deep appreciation of the variety of religions. So, certain people may find Judaism, the Christian tradition, or the Islamic tradition to be the most effective for them. Therefore, we must respect and appreciate the value of all the different major world religious traditions. I think that one way of strengthening the mutual respect is through closer contact between those of different religious faiths, personal contact. I have made efforts over the past few years to meet and have dialogues with the Christian community and the Jewish community, and I think that some really positive results have come of this. Through this kind of closer contact, we can learn about the useful contributions that these religions have made to humanity and find useful aspects of other traditions that we can learn from. We may even discover methods and techniques that we can adopt in our own practice. All of these religions can make an effective contribution for the benefit of humanity. They are all designed to make the individual a happier person and the world a better place. However, in order for the religion to have an impact in making the world a better place, I think it's important for the individual practitioner to sincerely practice the teachings of that religion. You must integrate the religious teachings into your life, wherever you are, so you can use it as a source of inner strength. And you must gain a deeper understanding of the religion's ideas, not just on an intellectual level, but with a deep feeling, making it part of your inner experience. There are so many things that divide humanity so many problems in the world. Religion should be a remedy to help reduce the conflict and suffering in the world, not another source of conflict. So, it is essential that we develop closer bonds among the various religions. Through this, we can make a common effort for the benefit of humanity. During the Dalai Lama's week of public talks in Tucson, he spoke about his own practices of prayer and meditation and ways to make the spiritual life part of one's inner experience. I think prayer is, for the most part, simple daily reminders of your deeply held principles and convictions. I myself repeat certain Buddhist verses every morning. The verses may look like prayers, but they are actually reminders. Reminders of how to speak to others how to deal with people, how to deal with problems in one's daily life, things like that. So for the most part, my practice involves reviewing the importance of compassion, forgiveness, all these things. And of course, 
It also includes certain Buddhist meditations about the nature of reality and also certain visualization practices. So in my own daily practice, my own daily prayers, if I go leisurely, it takes about four hours. It's <laughs> quite long. The thought of spending four hours a day engaged in spiritual practices raised a question about how to make time for spiritual exercises and prompted one of the Dalai Lama's most enlightening observations about the limitless nature of a spiritual life. 